Welcome to Movie Love. Oh, with some technical assistance, you can put together a dynamite fuck bill. <laughs> Where did you play? Can you fly, Bobby? I am a big, bright, shining star. Wanna take my temperature, Doc? I bet you got a big thermometer. Jesus. Well. No! All righty. Hey guys, welcome to another, I'm just going to move my chair around. Welcome to another uh, edition of um, Movie Loaf, everyone's favorite podcast that, um, you know, shows up intermittently, uh, kind of at random, sort of like... Um, uh, some sort of large fat bear or like we're, we're, we're the, we're the Hank, the bear of podcasts. Anyway. Um, so I, uh, I've, I've been, uh, off of my podcasting game for a while now, predominantly because of my, my extended break. If you don't follow my YouTube channel somehow, I had a bit of a moment where I was just like, I can't do this no more. I can't do it no more. The power of Satan just ain't with me. And uh, I decided to take a break. And technically the break was th was through March. Um, I haven't really taken a proper break. I've been working the whole time. But uh, that's that's neither here nor there. The point of this is uh, I, I made a whoopsie. And I failed to finish editing three whole episodes of Movie Loaf. Really just because I was burnt out. And I feel bad because those episodes were not just me talking to a mic or me and brad even because you know i can you know i could say fuck you to brad you know fuck that guy um which those uh, those will come back uh sooner rather than later but um i had three awesome guests and i recorded these months ago like before i took my break like i think like november i was when i recorded almost all of them and I did not do anything with them. So um, long story short, this is the first of a handful of episodes. I'm very excited about uh, this first one. We're talking about Jess Franco. Uh, all the all the business and, and beats and what have you are in the episode. And of course, you're watching this. It's, you know, you know from the title what, what you're watching. But uh, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this. And any future episodes, I'm going to try to be a bit more, um, a bit more, on it when it comes to the podcast because of course podcasts the beauty of them is that you know they're not videos they don't take as long to make they're conversations and what have you so they should be easier to get out and the one of the big reasons i didn't get these out sooner was i was very unhappy with my performance within them i felt like i was very low energy i looked disinterested on camera i wasn't disinterested in the moment in the moment i was very into it but for whatever reason i just look i mean i guess i look like I abduct children on like just on the daily. So there, there's, there's that already, but, uh, I, I found myself just looking like a real lame duck and that combined with just my sheer, just, just mental overload. I was like, you know what? I don't know what to do here. So I spent a lot of time like trying to figure out how I wanted to do it. And so what I came up with was a introducing them and explaining that, yeah, I look like shit. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I think that there there's more than enough content from the guests to make up for the fact that I'm so low energy and just all over the place in them. So I apologize, but I think it's, you know, they're fun. They're fun episodes. Uh, and the other thing I want to mention before we dig into it and we, we take that time machine back to the long, long ago of November or whenever the fuck I recorded these uh, is um, I'm going to go to mostly audio only on these podcasts. I want to make it as easy for me as possible to get these out so that I can focus on my normal videos and put out a ton of quality podcasting content. Uh, I decided that's probably where my big mental leap is. And that's where I'm most likely to fail again is in those like just not having the time or being overwhelmed by the amount of work. Cause of course I do all my own editing and I have a full-time job like I, I have like 18 jobs. So like I, uh, and most of them involve editing. So I get real burnt out on editing real fast. So, um, we're going to go to audio only with, you know, the occasional exception, whenever I feel like there's a really good 
video version. Um, for almost all of them, patrons will get a video version um, just as part of their, you know, what they're paying. Uh, so if you're a patron, you still will get video versions. I'm not going to be doing fully edited in those instances. They're just going to be, you'll, you'll see our fucking faces on the cameras. But uh, my main goal right now is just regarding the podcast to put out more content and find any way I can to make my life a little bit is easier so I can get more to you, the consumer. Uh, so yeah, um, that's, that's what's going on right now. Um, I'm going to go and see if the world is at war yet because we live in a wonderful time for everybody and, uh, yeah, enjoy this episode of movie loaf. Okay, so to, we've got we got a new segment of the Franco Files for you, you, you fucking Franco Files out there. <laughs> Today we have a very special guest uh, for this episode. We're gonna be talking about Vampiros Lesbos, the 1970 uh, Spanish West German co-production from Jess Franco, and our guest today is the one and only Jason Rudy. Hello, hello. Uh, Jason, please tell the the folks at home or in their cars or who are kidnapped victims listening to this on their kidnappers audio device, whatever the case may be. Uh, what's what's your deal, man? What's what... well? Uh, I've been a devotee of the Franco universe for about the last maybe four years, like headstrong. Um, I dived into the Franco universe maybe in like my early twenties first because I am a Christopher Lee fan. So I got into his films first through the Fu Manchu films and Bloody Judge and um, Eugenie and those films at first. And um, first I wasn't sure what to think about Jess Franco. Um, I wasn't really a big fan of his. I thought he was kind of inept and kind of like basic and I was kind of a snob because I was into the Stanley Kubrick and like Martin Scorsese and like all the typical when you first get into film and oh, this person's better than this person, blah, blah, blah. But then, uh, just something bit me on She Killed in Ecstasy and Virgin Mon Living Dead and uh, Vampiros Lesbos again. And certain films, I just started kind of digging. I started, I don't know, something bit me and then I just started going deeper and deeper and deeper and bought one or two and then started researching. And it was the Stephen Thrower books that I got those and really started learning about what films I kind of want to buy and find out about. And long story short, I basically collected uh, almost all of the Jess Franco films on DVD and Blu-ray and decided, well, hell, uh, there really isn't a Jess Franco podcast per se. So I decided to do one on all of his films because uh, I was looking around. I said, well, you know, uh, uh, Tarantino's got about, what, 12 films, 14 films, something like that. Scorsese's got 20, 30. And you start looking at people and you're like, well, shit, I could do like 170, 180 films through Jess Franco and really not get bored and, and learn myself and... And uh, so, yeah, so I've been doing that for since last October and we're on about episode 60 now. Well, nice, nice, nice. Um, I, I, man, if we guys, uh, guys at home, if we had just fucking kept up with this fucking podcast, we could have beaten Jason to the fucking punch. God damn it. But we did not We fucked up. We, we didn't have the resolve that Jason did. It's I, a uh, dedication as being every week, just being a singular vision. You do the whole universe and I've watched a lot of your things and you cover so much ground where I just cover one one square and you cover like sidewalks. So, you know, yeah, you're saying you were smarter than me. That's what you're saying. <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. Just found um, a little hole. So I, uh, so again, we're talking today about Vampiros Lesbos. Um, and uh, the reason I thought this one would work is, you know, I, I realized after our, my initial uh, foray into this particular loaf that uh, I should really be covering the bases, the, 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 the foundations of Franco and after his early work, the Dr. Orloff stuff, you know, uh, Count Dracula, which came just right before this, his more, let's say, uh, budgeted work. This is where we start getting into more of the Franco as we know, as we kind of like fanboy, like the, the stuff that when you get into Franco and you start like clicking with him and getting on his level, you get that sort of filmmaking as jazz mentality 
that he right. employed. And it really like this is a very strong foundation for that methodology. It's not too weird. It's not too out there. You know, we don't have loving close ups of uh, vaginas splayed open just yet. Uh, but we'll get there. We have, though, uh, plenty of very overt sexuality. We have the classic club dancing with on a, like a, a soundstage or whatever ver- right. with a crowd Turn just like added in <laughs> somewhere else, probably miles away. And tons and tons of uh, very experimental in- imagery. Uh, of course, we have like the scorpion relating to the vampire in this one. We have uh, that constant shot of the the blood trickling down the window. Uh, it's a sort of lovely menagerie of technique that as he would continue throughout his career, Franco would continue to experiment with and do some weird bullshit with. So what was your what was your first reaction to Vampiris Lesbos? What was or maybe even like how did, what was your um, first um, uh, interaction with it? Well, you know, it's funny because Vampiros Lesbos is almost like his most accessible film, I think, besides Venus and Furs, like people that kind of want to check out Just Franco, which is weird because Vampiros Lesbos is abstract, like you talked about, and it has a lot of his imagery and stuff and keystones that would be used over and over again in his films. But it's not really the best film to show people if you want to bring them into the Just Franco universe. But for me, it was Sold on Miranda. Uh, when I watched her, I just was mesmerized. And she has that quality where you just don't want to s- stop looking at her. She's just so beautiful. And she's got this certain charm to her. And she's so mesmerizing. And in other films, when she goes on to kill people and stuff, she looks like she's like a wild animal. And she almost looks like she's getting into it too much where they have to kind of calm her down a little bit. and. So you see all these different sides of her, how she's so elegant and this and that and just everything about her. So it was her that really drew me to kind of say, wow, what other movies has she done? And I looked in Eugenie and so on and so forth, you know. So Soledad, uh, I say Soledad Miranda because I'm just like the wow. most uncultured swine. Stephen Thrower in his, you know, uh, ultimate compendium of just Franco reviews and history. He says it's her most iconic and liberating role. What, what was the, um, her eyes, so much older than her smooth, haughty face, promise dangers that the tacky label scream queen can't contain a perfect combination of seductive nymph and evil spirit uh which is very and then compares her to uh, carmilla um the classic uh female vampire character and that that describes it perfectly soldad miranda uh probably the most uh important ingredient in this I, I, you know what fuck it the most important ingredient in yeah. this film in she's the factor totally like, uh like eva stromberg is 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 very good in the film I say very good. She's good. I wouldn't, yeah. I'm not going to go there. She's good. Right. She's, um, she's a little wooden, but she's solid. And she's believable because she believes what she's going through. So you yeah. believe that she believes it. You know. Yeah. I, I think my, my biggest problem with the film, and I'll get into this, but uh, is that uh, I don't understand why the Countess uh, Nadine Carity uh, really gives a fuck about her. Because <laughs> she's has this, ve- like, I, I, by the end, you understand that she needs her blood to survive. Right. But... Or, uh, there's a point where she just says like, "Oh, I, I need her. I'm captivated by her." So, you know, some such words. Right. Like, ah, uh, okay, I guess, uh, sure. I guess she wears that white suit. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, it also could be that she's so blank and she's so pure because it's like every shot she's in, she has a red purse, a red jacket. Franco just puts red on her, and every scene she's in, red candles, red. Every scene you Stromberg's in, it's like fresh blood. So it's like the fresh blood coming in and uh, as um, um, Soldog plays a, a Dracula's um, heiress, basically, uh, that she's just been through so much. So she sees her as almost a blank slate, kind of a way to start over or her death, you know, and then yeah, I guess maybe that's why she's so different. Yeah, I guess, yeah, Carity, uh, she has this, um, I mean, if you haven't watched the film and are listening to this first off what the fuck but secondly she recounts her story of becoming a vampire at one point uh to to her her servant morpho which franco loved his morphos she explains that she was raped and as this was happening count dracula shows up straight eats those guys and proceeds to drink from her 
and eventually turn her into a vampire. Which is a fucking cool backstory. Which is a fucking cool That's backstory. I think we should do a movie just on that whole situation when she was a kid, maybe being around Dracula and growing up or whatever. You know, that would be like. You know. Yeah, I, when I was, I, we watched it with my wife last night, mm-hmm. and um, I just turned to her and said, "Man, that's a great scene right there." Yeah. So, uh, Saul Dead Miranda completely just obliterates any other presence in this film. Uh, again, Eva Stromberg, perfectly good, but very blank. And any time that Miranda's on screen, it it's like you just are transported to a whole other world. She has the perfect face, as as Thrower stated. Her eyes just seem so much older in her face she has this way of moving that's um very regal without being pretentious or anything it's just kind of effortless and the fact that she died so young is like honestly one of the it's one of those great tragedies in cinema history that people don't really talk about as much because obviously she's a very niche property when it comes right down to it she wasn't really in a whole lot of things that you know the majority of people are going to know about um and it is it, it feels unfair because she just was so so great yeah because she so only did natural. like six films for just franco and that was it you know yeah and even um uh christopher lee uh, stated that she did amazing work in uh in count dracula oh yeah um where she played lucy is that right yeah being stupid right okay no of course this is just a version of dracula most uh, definitely uh it's it's what if dracula was a lady and also a lesbian and we took all the female characters and just kind of made them one except for like also there's kind of a renfield to the side <laughs> it's it's a very uh just taking all the all the uh all the dracula mythos and just plopping it down into one uh very simple story uh, yeah there's a uh, film. <laughs> no there's shades of the um, nosferatu type of film the uh, count dracula just Franco's Dracula and then all that, like you're saying, and then the, a Carmilla and you just kind of twist it and changes it and changes some of the things, especially if you're in a film and you kind of watch Dracula and you see these other things you're like, oh, that's just this. But he just flips it and changes it. And and he uses uh, that image a lot in his later films of um, uh, Soul Dog, which he's in the bikini laying on that um, uh, chase lounge. He uses that in uh, some of his later films with some of his other characters kind of uh, taking that shot over and over again. Because he was really affected by Soldat's death and for like up until Lena. And for that, it's really, so it's really cool to like study Jess Franco and go through the Stephen Thor books and to, and to watch each film, film by film, because you see the stuff he goes through. And after she died, like his films are just a search. So he just starts doing all these different stuff. He does the monster films. He does the... A uh, plane film, the crashing. He does the Devil's Island Lovers and all this other stuff. And there's shades of Soul Dot or things in not every film, but a little bit. There's something about her dying or something about her or something changed that really, it really affected him a lot, and it really colored his work until Lena and all that changed over. You know, that's really interesting. I haven't been able to um, really pick up on the the full effect yet, just in my yeah uh, watching through. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I, I look for it like when later, like in, I don't know, when, whenever I get through, uh, all the Jess Franco, I need to get through like this massive pile of discs in front of my TV, um, which I'm sure that all of our guests are so happy to see. But once I do, I we definitely need to talk about, uh, the whole, that whole kind of, um, arc Stretch. of career afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, this was a film, uh, this was the first, let me get the names right. Cause ugh, this was his first bankrolled by Arthur Browner. Yeah, I said Browder. Um, and they did a few films together. Uh, and Franco, uh, I watched the interview on the Severn disc for this film, uh, had a lot of respect for Browner. I, I, I think he said he was like one of the best producers he ever worked for. Um, yeah, Browder gave him the money and really had studio and, and uh, lavished his productions. Because you look at like the films he did, he did like... Uh, um, Vampiros Lesbos, uh, She Killed an Ecstasy, The Devil Came From, uh, Askvana, and then Soldad died, and then she had signed a contract with Browner to do like another five films or seven films or something, and so the films he picked up were a couple of the ones that she was supposed to star in, like uh, X312, uh, Flight from Hell. You see, oh, that's Soldad's character. You would see the person playing the part and yeah. such. So, uh, yeah, so he did give Franco a lot of money, not a lot of money per se, but a lot of money for him and kind of stayed out of his way. And as long as he really uh, delivered to him and he didn't like add a lot of insert 
shots like a lot of producers did later on, like Daniel Lasseur and and those guys did and stuff. You know, they were the ones that kind of messed with his films. And yeah, um, Broder definitely gave him some space, which is really good. Yeah, and they, um, if I remember correctly, the plan was to do several films culminating in one big film based around Soledad's performance. Yeah. Uh, which, again, fucking heartbreaking. Just, pr world ain't fair, guys. World sucks. This, we live no. in a horrible hellscape. Nothing happens when you die. Bada bing, bada boom. Fuck, fuck you. That's that's the world uh, we live in. So, uh, yeah, the... Let's see here. And those I didn't know, she died in a car wreck. Uh, she was uh, actually on the way to sign the contract or just after signing the contract with her husband or fiancé. I think it was her husband. And uh, the car was totaled. He didn't get a scratch, and she died. So Yeah, which... Awful to think about. Um, yeah. yeah, I... Uh, and left one or two children, I believe. Yep. Uh, it's... Ugh, just, just it hurts to it hurts to think about because that uh, what do you and like I mean beyond the obvious of just losing such a wonderful talent um, and by all accounts great person uh, like if you just look at it purely from the Franco standpoint probably totally different career given her living and them working together through these productions I mean I guess it could have just turned out the same because just Franco but I think she almost been, would been like a Barbara Steele probably. Like, she probably mm -hmm. would have done some really good films, and then, like, by, say, 72, 73, maybe, like, after these films were done, these five or seven films, she would have probably graduated to Hollywood and then maybe done, you know, a couple mid-films, mid, mid films, and then who knows, you know? But maybe, like, a Catherine Deneu or maybe, like, a um, Isabella Gianni, maybe, but, you know, somewhere around that level, I think. Yeah, maybe I don't know how a couple would, films, but... I don't know how it would work with her... Um being in such uh, lascivious content, but she, uh, yeah. she always strikes me as kind of like a total like Bond girl, like, like the oh, yeah. they would pick up. I would um, see that like, too, yeah. Yeah, she like uh, like a like a spy who loved me type. Yeah, yeah. Um, but better. One thing I, so I um, I didn't go back and read through the entire thrower segment because I was dealing with my, my, my video issues. Was there, um, do you know if there was like a missing scene from this film, because I know that like there's like even the version that we have is just like the version that Jess Franco most prefers. Yeah. Well, there's the Spanish cut, and then there's the German cut, and of course the Spanish has none of the nudity because of the censors and such at the time, and they couldn't have all that. So on the uh, Severn Blu-ray, there's those two cuts. The German one, though, um, the only thing I, you know, I think it's pretty solid. I'm not sure off the top of my head if there was anything cut. I kind of didn't read that section again. Um, but nothing that strikes me as anything major. Um, no outtakes or anything. Um, okay. was it yeah, because there's, there's, there's one moment where I was re-watching re it. And the first time I didn't really think about it. But my wife pointed it out that there's the point where, uh, oh shoot, the boyfriend character, Omar, Andre Manales, uh, he, I guess is bit or hypnotized or something uh, and winds up back at um, Dr. Seward's right. office, I think. And it, it kind of comes out of nowhere. You just, no, just you're, kind of there. you're right. There is that sequence because in the book, there's actually stills of him naked on a bed with her that you don't see in the film. So yeah, you are right. There is that section. Uh, Cause in the book, there's a couple of shots there looking at it. And then um, also too, I think that there might've been some stuff cut from when, Jess Franco is kind of getting ready to torture that woman in that little room, which is another thing to talk about. Jess Franco is really fucking creepy in this film. Oh yeah, Jess Franco is pitch perfect. I, so I one thing I, I love about Jess, uh, well, there's a lot of things I love about Jess, but yeah. one thing is he had no qualms with giving himself the most despicable piece of shit characters. He would just do whatever, uh, and especially if it was in service of what is essentially a feminist message. You know, I wouldn't say that he is necessarily aiming for, like, female audiences in this. It's definitely for the titillation of men. Right. But he is pushing a narrative where all of the men are either useless or awful people. Um, for example, the psychiatrist or psychologist, whatever. When we first meet him, he's listening to um, Linda talk through these dreams that she's having that are, you know, very heavy lesbian dreams. And he's just drawing stick figures. Right. Paul and Mueller. It's, yeah, yeah. It's the fucking funniest thing in the world. So you have him on one end of the spectrum. Uh, then you have her boyfriend, who's just very bland and uninteresting. 
And then you have Jess Franco's character, uh, Mehmet, who works for this hotel and, you know, as a side gig, tortures and murders uh, women. Yeah, who, just a little side deal. Yeah, <laughs> who have uh, become entranced by the Countess. I think there's a backstory with his, like, his wife was driven... Crazy. His wife had went to the island and left him, so he was so resentful of her, yeah. Right, yeah, and, you know, the women women can leave their men for other women. Uh, and so he is torturing and murdering women because he's gone bonkers, cuckoo, banana pants. And it's uh, a very – the way he, he, he does this thing where he just, like, kind of almost, like, curls up with uh, Linda – uh, as she's tied to this chair and is like very love, almost lovingly is a strong word, but uh, with a lot of uh, passion, right. he's like um, caressing her leg and maybe scratching her a bit. Can't really tell exactly what his intention is uh, in the actual physical movement. He's also very stupid. He's a very dumb little guy. Yes, yes. Uh, he's always he, playing he, with little ropes and sitting there and just figuring things out, listening. Franco doesn't seem to really care too much about the means so much as the end a lot of the time so like okay we need we have this character who's tied up and she's going to be tortured and killed but we need to get her out of the situation so how is she going to get out of the situation oh she's just going to ask him to untie her because she's says that he'll, she'll let him torture and kill her uh and he just believes it fuck it why not and uh it goes exactly like that she kills him bada bing bada boom no problem uh, no, 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 no must, no fuss. Right. Uh, it's, and then also you have Dennis Price in the film too, who's another worthless person where he's supposed to be this one that's curing people, but he wants to be a vampire just like her and wants to follow her and everything. Too, yeah. So. Uh, Dr. Seward from, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the actual Dracula story. Uh, right. Which is another Dr. Seward is actually figured in quite a few Franco films after this as well. Actually just the name Dr. Seward. So he really? uses a lot of the Dracula characters. Uh, names in in other films. So, God, I love I love I love the Franco verse and just his use. Oh of, yeah, <laughs> the Doctor uh, Orloffs, the um, the um, Caligastros, and, and all the different characters that he can take that's filtered in. You know, you know the, the biggest problem with this podcast is it uh, makes me want to just uh, throw away all the actual work I have to do and just watch more Just Franco. Uh, like, yeah, all it's I want to do. Yeah, because there's like the whole Marvel universe, but like the whole Franco universe is really cool. Like I was saying, if you watch them film by film, you see these certain characters are in five or six films or um, I shouldn't say characters, um, actors are in five or six films and they'll disappear and somebody else will take their place. And certain actors will look like other actors and just kind of play the same type of roles. And they have uh, characters that show up again and again, played by different people, you know. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, and it's really a cool thing. This film shares, I think, most of the same cast as Eugenie, right? Yes. Uh, and then also, um, She Killed an Ecstasy uh, right after, which is one of my favorite, favorite films. Actually, uh, I made a um, remake, update, reimagining of that film recently. That's a film that I just finished shot at shooting, so. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. let's, okay, let's, let's do the whole um, uh, 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 pushing our wares thing. Um, tell me more about Sounds that. Good. Yeah, well, uh, I did a film called um, uh, Lady Hyde, and it's basically about a woman whose husband is a scientist, and he um, deliver he um, figures out a, um, a a COVID vaccine, and he goes to both the board and uh, comes with them with his results, and the board members already have their own. Um, uh, vaccine already figured out and formed and so they conspire against him and drive and so basically I, I follow some of the same beginning where he goes back to his house he goes crazy they get away and then he kills himself and then she snaps and then from there we find out it's changed the characters where lady hyde jekyll and hyde hyde she hides away and then comes back and before she met him she was a woman who wears this um uh, church key around her neck kind of similar to this actually like that oh yeah there we go and uh and she uses that to actually kill people and she's a painter so she opens up paint cans and she opens up bodies to take the blood out the, the force the life force and uh so she goes after the scientists who made her husband kill himself um, one by one and uses different means to kill the people 
similar to the other film. Uh, but I shot it um, up in um, the mountains and the hills up here in uh, 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 Northern California, um, up in these really cool old train tunnels um, up by uh, Auburn, uh, by uh, Reno, up in that area. And so we got a lot of cool stuff of basically her with the purple cape. So I, and I use purple a lot in this as well. And um, Liz Claire is the actress that plays um, Lady Hyde, um, Miss Hyde. Um, and uh, yeah, and just we shot that in. Basically, uh, from studying Franco, all his styles and stuff, I kind of figured out his shooting formula and seeing how he would do a film in about a week and a half. And he'd turn over and, and do another film, another film. Uh, originally, I was going to do like his thing. I was motivated. I was going to do about five or six films. But I got to about two films. I did two films in about two and a half weeks and uh, then was exhausted and had to sleep for about three, four days. I was like, God damn, Franco do do like, because one year Franco did like 14 films and had like 12 got finished out of 14 and released. So I was like, well, if you could do 14, maybe I could do like six. But yeah, I did two and then uh, I'm still editing the two right now. But uh, yeah, it's crazy. I got a rough cut of Lady Hyde and then I did a, um, a uh, Emmanuel uh, film. Um, Emmanuel in Sin City, kind of update of uh, Emmanuel in Las Vegas, and I uh, did my own film with that. So those are the two that I did back to back. Well, that's fucking rad as hell. Thanks. Um, do you have any uh, idea when you you're planning on like finishing? <sighs> well, um, I'm telling everybody like probably uh, summer of next year or uh, sooner. You know, I think with about maybe six months because I got rough cuts right now. I got uh, one and about halfway through the second one. I go go through and do all the sound and do all the color correction and everything, and then uh, figure it out from there. And then in the meantime, I actually got back into um, um, being a, a pro wrestler again. So uh, at my advanced age, so yeah, so I've been kind of juggling all three and my podcast. So trying to figure out times, just like you talk about, I have all of your projects. You know, it's uh, so many projects to do, but it keeps you alive and uh, keeps you young. You know, and that's, that's pretty rad. Did you um, employ a lot of zooms in your film? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I actually, well, it's funny because like with the podcast, we have a thing called the Franco list and I try to have as much items on the Franco list because basically on the podcast, there's like, if you start watching the Franco films, you start seeing repetitions. We talk about keystones and this and that and stuff. So I basically try to have as many of the Franco items in my films. Like he always has a body of water. He has a sailboat. He has boats. He has palm trees. He has uh, sound effects. He has a uh, chained up people dance scenes on stage, stripping, club scenes, dancing, jazz music, excessive zooms, out of focus shots, mirror shots, mind control themes, um, red lights, uh, mad scientists, fish tank shots, and so on and so forth, uh, talking animals, um, handwritten notes on signs, um, inept cops, and belly chains. A lot of belly chains in his later films. Uh, awesome, wow, I actually, you know it's funny, um... I have a movie that we're working on right now that we just started uh, sort of shooting. We're doing like um, like some basic shots that we already had thought out and then we're going to get into like heavy production. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it has COVID as a like side element yeah. kind of informing the main action. And a lot of what we're doing as far as the film style is based on Franco. So based on a few different filmmakers. Um, yeah. But uh, he's a very heavy element of that pastiche. That's um, good. Yeah. yeah. And, and and Franco is such a huge influence that a lot of people really should look to him because like for me starting my own podcast kind of, well, cause before that I, I did films from like 2007 to about 2018. And I kind of took a break for like two years or three years. And when I got back into the podcast, it kind of got that spark again and just learning Franco and seeing like how he shot everything. And a lot of people could read the books on Stephen Thrower, watch his films and see how he does things because He's really an inspiration to a lot of low budget filmmakers and he uses his own money and sometimes even almost next to nothing and shot some really cool films with just on his extra locations or he'd shoot side films while he was making other films. Most of the time he'd shoot two or three films at one time, you know, on the locations and just change your angles and have this person put on this different outfit and, you know, and just edit all your stuff together. And he was just, that was his motivation. That was his focus. And if that's one thing I really admire about him is how, singularity he was in his vision and that's all he was is just making movies you know and that kept him alive for so long and making so many films good or bad you know still yeah i would say i mean out of all filmmakers i mean not well out of uh 
a lot of the filmmakers that you might stumble across as um, an aspiring filmmaker. He's definitely one of the most, I think, important for people to look up to and, and emulate to some degree, not necessarily in style, because um, obviously his style is not going to be the most commercial. So if you, want, if, you want, right. if you want success financially, then maybe don't like emulate. But as far as like learning from his technique and learning from his drive and learning from how he would put these things together, it's so much better than like a Kubrick, where it's oh, just yeah. like, you're not going to be a fucking Kubrick. And even then, do you really want to be? He's kind of a dick. Jess Franco. Uh, on record, not a dick. Uh, no. Like, uh, easy to work with, nice yeah. guy, uh, but strong resolve, strong work ethic, always going. Like, you know, when when people talk about the hustle, like Jess Franco, king of the hustle. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. absolute king. Also king and, of smoking cigarettes every second of his life. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes he wasn't on the up and up. I mean, he skipped town and took films with him and disappeared and this and that and stuff. But you know, I mean. Everybody has their tail. And I, I tell you what, I mean, I'm not going to have the money to do this, but somebody should do a bio on Jess Franco. It'd be an amazing movie. Oh, like, my God. You know, I don't even know I, how you, where you would start, but absolutely it would be. Yeah. I just imagine every scene he'd be like, anytime he's wor like working on something, every scene would be a different film. And you would just like not even consider it. Just It would just be in the background like, you know, we as we're going through the story, he's just working on something different. You just have different actors every time. Yeah, they're never like because I see like uh, Kendall Jenner could be sold on Rhonda. Like she's her shape. Look, okay, like I look at her Twitter pics and I see certain shots like that could be sold on, especially when she's really elegant when she wears her hair down and she dresses really long dresses and stuff. She has that certain essence of of sold on certain times. And that's that what I was like craziest mashing of worlds yeah i would like, but it was the so, least, least mainstream with the most mainstream just married together yeah 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 and then you get like johnny depp to play you know Fr franco with his long hair and that kept saying he could be ed wood and jess franco and you know people are mentioning tall, those two the but... same breath that's true that's true but uh yeah no it's I always thought that would just be an amazing film that i'm shocked that nobody's done it yet and they've done films on so many different directors you know it's yeah, that's, make making a mental note here, guys. Making a mental note here. If I ever get free, successful, that's fine. Free idea. Free idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna direct a lifetime movie, and I'm gonna direct a Jess Franco biopic. Those are the sure. two. Those are the two dreams. Now, those are the two. Just right, right there on the edge. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. So uh, let's wrap this up. Vampires Lesbos. Um. Is there anything else that really you think we should talk about regarding this landmark film? Well, um, like you were saying, it basically watching this again uh, after seeing 60, 70 films of Franco, it does, like you're saying, it does introduce a lot of his touchstones that he uses a lot. Um, and I think this is more like a party. Like it's more like just stuff that's going on, all the symbols and all the free form narrative and, and, the, and, the, and the story that does continue all the way through. So I think if you can hang with this film and you like it, then you're more inclined to be in the Jess Franco universe. But Jess Franco made like a, a wide variety of films, maybe like at least 10 to 12 different style of films. So if you don't like this film, you still might like Jess Franco. So, but uh, I, I would recommend it. Uh, it's something really cool to watch. And uh, especially now for Halloween, um, most people, I mean, a lot of people maybe here haven't seen this film. So I would say check it out. It's uh, widely available. Uh, Severin put out a really good Blu-ray. Yeah, it's a it's a solid it's a very um, it's a good litmus test for folks, yeah. um, and you can go multiple ways, um, as you said, Jason. You know the, his noirish stuff from before, his you know like the Doctor Orloff, um, you know the kind of black and white. Uh, the um, I can't think of the name. The uh, Doctor X one. Um, oh, um, Doctor Z. Dr. Z, Dr. thank you. Yeah, Dr. Z. Michael Dr. Z uh, is a phenomenal piece of work that yeah. is extremely different and uh, feels much more like a classical black and white gothic horror film with some some quality body horror, I got to say. Yeah. And um, you know, you can and then you can go even more experimental. This isn't experimental enough for you. Like that's actually one thing I like Vampiros Lesbos a lot. Um, I don't. I've only revisited it this once, so I've seen it twice because it doesn't go quite as far for me. It's a bit too in between uh, yeah. for my tastes. Uh, so I'm more of like a shining sex kind of guy. One of those okay, right, right. shot on the back of another movie. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Cause it's so bonkers and so bizarre. And then I also really love again, like the Dr. Z where it's 
just very classy and um, beautiful to look at. Uh, I mean, all of his, most most of his films are beautiful in some way to look at, but like that one's more classically beautiful. And it's interesting because he is he was a director who had a lot of talent, who also had some interesting uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, not everybody can dig the zooms. My wife was laughing her ass off yeah. at the zooms, which it they are funny. Uh, it does get some really films are heavier cool. than others. Some are a little bit, and some are just boom, 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 yeah. boom. Uh, there's one. Um, I, it's not Night of Open Sex, but it was uh, released along with that by Severin, and I can't think of the title. But uh, there's a scene that I cries think of pleasure. Yes, uh, yeah. where like they're just like he's just like there's a whole scene. I don't know if it's a sex scene or just a dialogue scene or both, but it's several minutes of like he must have had a huge magazine on that camera because there's several minutes of zooming in and out. Well, <laughs> but that film's like rope too. So for argumentative sake, cause he has to keep that one long shot, the whole film, there's no cut or there's very little cuts in that film. And that was the gimmick of small amount of cuts. So he used that going to something, zooming in, zooming out, panning around, zooming in, zooming out, which is yeah, silly, but that's the reason why he did it for that yeah. part. Um, I think it, it helps that most of his, and this film is a prime example of that. Uh, but, they're very shaky zooms often. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I read somewhere where like one of his cinematographers, maybe multiple cinematographers, were just driven nuts by his love of the zoom um, because he just, <laughs> just like constantly just is he gonna oh oh yep. Uh, there's well, there's like once uh, my wife was like oh is he gonna use a zoom in this scene and then it cut without zooming but it cut into uh, a close up zooming out. And it was just like, yes, oh, oh, bathe, bathe me in it, bathe me in it. One other thing I want to throw in real fast too is one thing people should really admire Franco is he did so many, so much on all of his films under different names and such. And we could talk about that on another episode. But yeah, all the different fake names he used for the music, the cinematography, the writing, the everything, you know. So yeah, take note, Neil Breen's out there. Uh, use different names. Just, yes. If you just if you just say everything was under the same guy, people think it's a smaller production. But you right. can make them believe. I don't know why I'm looking over here. Uh, you can make them believe <laughs> that uh, it was a bigger production just by throwing some fucking names in there. Oh yeah. You know, just just say fuck it. You know, it doesn't. No one. No, no one knows. Everyone. No. Everyone's. Everyone's just making shit up. I'm making shit up right now. No one knows anything. We're all. It, we're all clueless. And if they know, they're soccer and they're paying too much attention to you. So exactly. relax. Exactly. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Jason. Um, I finally completed a short episode of yes. this segment. I look forward to having you back for more. For sure. And uh, yeah, there's just there's so much Franco to talk about. Holy God, it's just an endless endless menagerie of of dreams and pleasures and nightmares. And yeah, looking forward to more. Yes, it's a for me. It's a weekly weekly deal. So me franco every week and that's how i live so. tell remind people of your podcast do it uh yeah uh we do the franco observer podcast uh we do uh one film a week uh every wednesday morning a, a new episode drops usually 60 to 90 minutes long uh audio podcast uh you can find us on all listening platforms please subscribe share tell all your friends about it uh yeah we're on about episode 60 by the time this drops and uh gonna try to do all 180 or so films of his so that's the plan. Fuck yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. And uh, guys, y'all, whether it be a Jess Franco movie or some other movie, but preferably a Jess Franco movie, uh, either which way, go watch a movie. Do it. Do it.